this conversation today is, is a series of conversations <laughs> around the country, which we will dive into in just a moment. But I do want to inform you about something that's happening really, really exciting um, that started yesterday in Sacramento, where I was for um, an arts advocacy day, a joint hearing, um, the, the joint committee on the arts and hearing on the impact of the arts in California. Um, and we heard some really amazing things, um, even amazing to advocates, uh, like one out of 10 jobs in California is in the creative economy. With 1.4 million jobs, it's 8% of California's gross domestic product, billions and billions of dollars, and uh, the chair, uh, Senator Liu of the committee, and his counterpoint, um, Ian Calderon from the assembly both got so excited about these facts and the importance of our sector to California that they are offering competing bills to refund the California Arts Council. Yes! One in the assembly, and we also had a series of lawmakers who were pissed off that they could not be the primary um, author of these bills. <laughs> Never before has the arts advocates have been in this position, I can tell you. <laughs> So um, we will be getting back to you with more about how you can and must help us push these th bills through each of your houses and then on to the next one, the best bill win. But in any case, um, I think we stand the likeliest chance since the big cuts of 2003 to getting some real money into the California Arts Council so that you can be doing more of the work that you're doing. So follow that. Um, this just in. So and there's a great article about it today in, L in today's LA Times, and I was just on the phone with Sam Musiker from K3D, so there's, the press is picking up on it, and we'll be, you'll be hearing and reading more about it, and you'll certainly be hearing about it from us. But that's not why we're here today. Um, we're here today to continue a conversation that we are, we are engendering around the country, um, Theater Bay Area and Theater Development Fund, Tori Bailey, the executive Hi. director there, and very generously by the Dork, uh, the Dork Duke Foundation. <laughs> Dork Foundation. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. Um, we're having Washington here in the Bay Area, New York coming up next, Chicago, Minneapolis, and Los Angeles. Um, examining this question, or this concept of, uh, of a three-way, kind of triangular relationship between generative artists the theater companies that produce them in the audiences who come. And it, it's not so much a problem statement as it is an exploration of what, what does that relationship look like? What is that dynamic? And what can we all do as theater makers, generative artists, theater companies, those of us who support you, to, to strengthen that relationship and ultimately to increase an appetite for new work and for theater, all kinds of theater, among in, in society. And, and, and that's sort of the big, big purpose of what we're doing today um, and over the next many months. Uh, we had a conversation this morning with a smaller group of people. This is enlarging that conversation. This morning's conversation was um, kind of off the record. Martha's taking notes, but not attributing any of the comments by name. This afternoon's um, conversation is very much on the record and in fact being live streamed on New Play TV. So everything you say can and will be used to um, and broadcast immediately up coast to coast. But it's just a different way of involving um, an even larger uh, community in, in these conversations. And Mark will tell you in a moment about ways that you can continue to be involved in the conversation online and, and going forward. Um, that's that's what, well, you say some other things. Yeah, okay. I have just a couple of things to say. First of all, um, thank you all for giving up your time to be here this afternoon. Um, and for those of you who've been with us all day, I think there's a lot of really good work going on all sorts of places about audience engagement, right? I mean, the Walt Sons have done a lot. Um, TCG is doing re-evolution, talking about audiences. The thing that's a little different about what we're trying to do and kind of where this came from was a realization that, you know, there, there as you saw with the two studies you read, um, you know, Alan is looking at theaters and audiences, and we owe a big thank you to both South Coast and Steppenwolf and said to Alan he could use that work to do some of what you read. Um, Zani was looking at the relationship between the playwrights and the theaters, which we got into a lot of conversation during Outrageous Fortune about a lot of stuff, but the part that was missional was on of interest to TDF with respect to mission was the stuff that had to do with the writers and the theaters. And there hasn't been a lot of 
There are a lot of people doing a lot of really good work, which Polly has surfaced in terms of bright lights, a kind of three-way conversation. But it's, we're all in this together. And so how do we, in an era when you know, we are still looking to increase the noise and the vibrancy that the theater has in as wide a community as it can have, you know, what, what, how do we have all three of us talking to each other? And for TDF, which is an organization whose primary mission is building audiences um, and trying to create an appetite for the theater and mm -hmm. make sure that folks who, that, you know, we kind of fundamentally believe it's the birthright of everybody in New York City to go to the theater if they choose to. Um, service organizations have an opportunity to work on issues like this. And so it's really, that's where, I think that's where TBA comes in. I think that's where we come in. And what we're hoping to do out of all of this work is um, the, the next step will be some more research work in one shape or form, and we don't really know yet what that is, engaging the audiences even more, right? There was a convening in Arena a couple of years back um, as part of the New Play Institute that was, that was when Rocco gave the famous um, scarcity and abundance speech. And Brad and I looked at each other, we were both there and said, the problem isn't that there are too many theaters, the problem is that we're not doing our job well enough in terms of getting in the people to come see it. And then we had further sessions later that weekend and the, I remember a playwright said, why is it that we're always sitting here talking about the audience and we never actually put them in the room? And so the next piece, I think, is some research that we'll do this summer. And we're using these sessions in large part to try and figure out what more do we need to know and talk to our audiences about. What are the assumptions that we bring to the table about them that we would love? And it's to hear from you guys what resonates, what's needy, what you'd like to know more about. And so mm -hmm. that's really kind of, you know, that, that's where this comes from. So um, not just a desire not to be in New York kind of day when we get a tiny chance of snow. <laughs> so um, that's where we are, so take it away. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, just very quickly, if we could just kind of know who's in the room and for you all to, and for these folks to get to know you a little better, if you can just, you know, your name and um, your, if, if you're with the theater institution or two institutions, mm -hmm. say their names and your various hats that you may wear. You may be an administrator, you may be a playwright and actor, I don't know. So we'll start in the corner and work our way around, but quickly, so we have time for the conversation. Uh, Gary Graves, company co-director, Central Works. We do all new works, I'm a playwright and a director. Jess Beisler, also with Central Works, I'm a co-director and also a director and performer. Jennifer Hyman is Tuesday, director of our teacher of the foundation and is voted audience member. Will Suze with Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor Allen, Black Box Theater Company, uh, playwright and actor. Jordan Puckett, literary manager at the San Francisco Playhouse and playwright. Anna Schneiderman, executive director of Ragged Wing Ensemble, also Director for Berkeley Rep, and I'm a TBA board member. Kyle 
Pass or get something marketing manager if we're here at the Robin Dolan, audience services manager here at the Aurora. Suzanne Appel, managing director of the Cutting Ball Theater. Katie Fahey, associate program officer of Kenneth Brandon Foundation. Lauren J. Gilzaria, founding artistic director of Bulls and Slip Productions. I'm Terry Lamb, I'm an actor and I'm on the board of Bulls and Slip. Bob Miller, I'm on the board of Bulls and Slip. I'm Susan Terrebrook, I'm on the board of Theater Works, and I write uh, theaterplaybyplay.com, a blog about new works. Jill Medichap, I'm the center. Terrific actor, I'm a playwright, director, and I'm also on the board of Bulls and Slip. Loretta Greco, who's an artistic director of the Magic Theater, also an audience member. <laughs> <laughs> Freelance Director and Membership Services for Theatre Bay Area. Dana Harrison, Managing Director at Theatre Bay Area, Producer and Audience Member. I'm Ignacio Zulueta, I'm a playwright, uh, Alter Theatre Associate Artist, and the new Shotgun Box Office Associate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mickey Goldhaber, a playwright and director, and I'm on the prowl. <laughs> Lauren Anderson, I'm a playwright. Amy Mueller, uh, Artistic and Executive Director of Playwrights Foundation. I'm Mark Vogel. I'm a consultant with arts organizations and the funders who love them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Susie Maddock. I'm Managing Director of Berkeley Repertory Theater. Great. Um, so what we wanted to do was just frame a little bit about the conversation that we are, will be having this afternoon, um, a little bit about what we've been hearing already and earlier today and also in Washington last week. Um, and then we're going to split up into, into four breakout groups and spend about 45 minutes in each one of those groups asking you to choose one of the four one kind of questions that boiled up earlier today that were completely left unanswered that we'd love to kind of find out more about. Um, we would encourage you to take that question, run with it, veer away from it as you will. Um, and then we will come back in um, the, for the final 45 minutes or so to have a larger conversation together building upon the conversations that you have in your four groups. So that's a bit of what we're going to be doing um, this afternoon. <coughs> Do you want to maybe recap those four questions that we've got in front of us? Yes, yeah, so um, <coughs> what I'm going to give you are, <laughs> as Brad said, these are questions that were bubbling up at the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. and we feel like, oh my god, we haven't solved theater yet. We have to keep talking about it. <laughs> and um, let me say in advance that the language I'm about to use is, is not going to be as exact as possible, but hopefully even the language I'm using, if you want to refine the language yourself in your groups, that might be fun. So one of the big questions that we were very interested about was, what do we assume that the theater is, and why do we assume that anyone would want to go, and how are we telling audiences about those assumptions? Does that make sense? Like, what do we assume that the theater is? Why do we assume that anyone should want to go in the first place? And what are we doing to communicate to audiences those assumptions? Another question that we had is, well, this is, I'm going to say we, even though I'm not from No, we were we. You were we. We, we meaning everyone in the room. I am speaking the royal we. No, no, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, how do we as artists in the Bay Area get our individual audience communities to go in and see the work of other theater companies? How do we get our audiences to come to us to go see the work of other people? At what point, well that's question two. Uh, question three, at what point in the process of development and production should we get the audience engaged? Where in the process of, of development and production should the audience start to engage? And uh, question four, at, with, at what point should an artist become engaged with promoting the uh, uh, a production to the public? A playwright, a director, a designer, whatever. At what point should the artist become engaged at letting the public know what is happening and what it means, contextualizing it. Does that make sense? So those are the, those are four things that felt, yes? Uh, just 
playwright has a new play, should the should the playwright start from the second that that play gets announced for the season talking to the marketing director? Should the playwright be out on the street drumming up audiences from the beginning? Should it never happen? You know, the artist engagement in selling the thing. I think. In some conversations, even I mean, one of the things that's resonated both days so far is. Um, some conversation about some of some of the some people are doing really good work with getting artists. It's that thing where the audiences know the writers over time at a theater, right? What's the arc of time and how do you get them involved? When should if a playwright is coming back to a theater, having been there before, when are they coming into that conversation? So really, you know, you hear a host of you hear a host of responses when you ask folks about when are they when do they get involved? Do they get involved? Know, should they get involved? Do they want to get involved? So all of that. But what 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 do people feel like is the optimal? Where on that time frame should it be? <coughs> is it one answer, or do you want a lot of? This is you guys. These are just things for you to start talking about. Right? I think it's, it's, our our feeling was that when the when it was time to end the morning session, that those questions were like there was a hundred there were a hundred things left to say about them, and we would just love to keep talking. And, about but them. a little context, I think, because. The first two questions come out of um, a lot of conversation in Alan's study about risk, right? And, and that whole risk continuum. And then there's one kind of risk conversation that has to do with the risk taking that your audience that you already have is doing. And how do you move them along? And how, do you, how far ahead of them do you want to be? And then another piece of the conversation is what's the risk for the people who aren't even in the room yet? Right? What's the risk factors that we talk? I mean, risk isn't a bad thing, right? Someone was saying at lunch that the only industry in which we consider risk a bad thing seems to be ours. You know, a lot of other places, risk is, you know, that's how you break through. But, you know, what, so, so some of the questions about, the question about, you know, how do you talk to people who aren't there about whether it's, what do we do to help get people into the room, onto that continuum, who aren't on it at all? And what do we do about the folks who are already there? And so there was a lot of conversation back and forth about things about how you open up the door. Susie, you have your ears. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm. It seems as though you're starting from a premise that I, I, maybe needs to be spoken. The uh, an assumption that we're t are we talking specifically about new work, or are we simply talking about what is the audience's relationship? Work. Well, because that's a really smart question. As we said this morning, a lot of this is messy. This is the second conversation. This started being about new work because that's where outrageous fortune and juristic impact were. And then as you start talking about risk, you realize that there's a lot of risk for people who haven't even been in the door. I think we're mostly talking about new work. I think we're mostly talking, but work is new to a lot of people, even if it's established when they meet it the first time. And some people have said, you know, if I do a classic, and I do it in a new and reimagined way. So I think I think Chekhov is new to anyone who's right. never seen it before. Sure. And, right. that's what, so and I think that's where we're where moving. We're I think I think that's where we're moving. And it certainly I think is where this morning's group moved was in this. In, so for this conversation, I think it's really about work that's new to the audience, even if it isn't doesn't have to be new to us. It's work that's new to its audience. Is that, when I mean, you were talking about the risk of doing a play written in 1200, yeah. and, I mean, that's a, right, that's a very new play, even though it's however many years old. Well, so piggybacking on what you're saying, Susie, and we were talking with Carrie Perloff about this a week or two ago, and she was saying, in her experience in ACT, that it's often actually easier to get people to come to new work, like Stuck Elevator, than it is for, you know, some more obscure classic works that are, are, are even harder for someone to wrap their arms around. But the diff, which, so both of one might, you know, the newer work might be actually less risky in a way than an older work. But the difference about new work is that you have the potential of having the generative artist actually in the room with the audience. And, so is that and that's, not, really that's not a possibility um, with other And, and for, me, for, their, you're with the, for me, you can also, if it's a classic, you can have the director in the room. I mean, it's a conversation about how, how do we take advantage of the artists in the room, should we? How do we engage them in moving it forward? How do we talk about the work for the audience? What are those entry points that we need to help make it bigger? Okay, so that's helpful. But then my mm -hmm. second question, before mm -hmm. I go into it, Rebecca, is it sounds as though we're operating on the assumption that that is that that there is some something that that is deeply desirable about having people experience more than just the work it's, itself. Is there is 
do, is that is this something that we agree upon, or that there's data that's? Well, I think we should interrogate that. I mean, there is some data around that. That the in, the, the engagement piece of that that came out of um, the intrinsic impact work, and I think was reflected in this piece that that Alan wrote around this was on, in that matrix that he created of like less engagement, more engagement, and then you know propensity like risk aversion to risk seeking that he's proposing. And again, this is sort of we're testing these ideas. Maybe they're flawed. Maybe they, maybe it's completely crap. But you know, is there something about being engaged around it in conversation, digging in more deeply, being literally in conversation with Lauren around her work or with other people in the audience? Does that, this is what the intrinsic impact work found, it does seem to, it, at least in our research, it did seem to make the impact deeper and last longer. So there was a way that, that those other ways of engaging in and around and conversing around the work did enhance um, the impact. And, for, and put for most folks that we were that we were surveying. And I guess more pragmatically, at least from my point of view, a sense that certainly is what we see when we're working with first time theater goers and doing extra you know community groups and stuff, that the more engaged or the more impacted or the more thinking about it later, the more likely to go back another time. And if you're trying to take, if you're trying to take really casual attendees, how do we mix them in with our core, you know, we have, there's those folks that always come and are there, you know, typically a subscriber, but how do we, what is it you do to increase the likelihood that someone will come back a second time or maybe a third time? And there were some really interesting, fabulous things this morning, stories about, you know, if you, or, you know, they gave you free tickets so you could bring people who then went out and sold set, right? So how do we do that? Is that fair? Yeah, but I would certainly push on it. If you're, yeah. I mean, like, everyone, like, interrogate these, these concepts and assumptions because that's, that's a big part of it. So for some folks who are there this morning, what are we leaving out and not capturing? Is there anything? Well, but what Susie basically just broached or brought up, mm -hmm. which are sort of the, 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 um, uh, ways in which people are entering into mm -hmm. a dialogue with the theater. You know, she, she, she literally yeah. said, is it just the experience of being in the theater or are we assuming a lot of other interactive right. I don't, And I, I think one of the things that's in, for me that's important is there's no right or wrong. This is not about things anybody's doing wrong. This is actually about calling out a whole lot of things that a lot of people are doing really well and trying to figure out how we can share them and move them on and, and say these are things that in our experience are working. And it isn't, the, I don't think there is an answer. I think some of, some of the well, I'm just saying that that question is left off. Of this, yeah. The, the, it's not on these four. Right, but that's fine. But, so let me just try to frame the yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Robert can correct me, but we've done a lot of research with a very avid theater audience right. mm -hmm. that has mostly said to us, don't give us more. Right. <laughs> we don't ask us to do anything else. We come to the theater because we love going to the theater. We love the work that we do. We love the amount of information you give us. Quit asking us to do other things. But basically, yeah. there's a contract that we have that they have with us that says what they want is is a, is a certain is 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 theater. They're coming to the theater. They appreciate the fact that we're providing it to them. And, and, and that's great. Now there's a whole, we know that with newer audiences, people who have no context, that there's a different set of issues right. about them. But in a conversation that's framed as broadly as this, mm -hmm. we, could, we could end up um, making a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. based on um, a, a really broad question right. okay, that, we then, um, that we then use as, as not just apocryphal, but as actually sort of data right. that drives us in very wrong directions. Right. Well, I think, right. So I think this is great. So I mean, and that is exactly <coughs> perfect, right? Because that was, it, it's actually part of that seems to be suggested in Alan's research, that those who know more about a form, because he mentions ballet in there too, they just, they just get more out of it, right? But those folks who know a lot about ballet, they don't need to sit down in a ballet 101 class before the ballet starts. They've got it, right? So it could well be that you are, I would not be surprised that Berkeley rep audiences who come all the time are actually really, really well versed about the form. And they don't, they don't really need it, and nor do they want it, as they're, you're asking them. But another group of folks may, right? So they're not necessarily coming
context. So the two data, data yeah. things so don't necessarily data. cross themselves out. Right. But, yeah. but there's also about like no audience, and right? Yeah. 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 No, and also I would say personally, it's really interesting because you, I don't, I bet they didn't walk in the door that way ten years ago, or maybe they did, and that's who they are. Well, this is Berkeley. Well, so but, but you're also <laughs> asking this much broader question about about audiences and the role of theater in society in general, and that and that uh, somebody said earlier today, and it's pretty well known anyway, that you know theater is has definitely as an art form become less significant to larger numbers of people, right? And, and that in, for some theaters, many theaters, their audience participation is dropping to some extent. And so the, 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 I, the bigger uber question is, is what, you know, in the 21st century, what, how, what is our engagement with audiences in, our, in order to grow them? And to get people coming. Uh, so, yeah. you know, if that's the context, from that yeah, perspective, what's the engagement right. piece? Well, so let me also just say this, and, no, sorry, Lauren. Yeah. Um, we're not, we really are not driving towards, it's not like we've got the answer and we can't wait for you to get to the right answer <laughs> that we already have in the envelope here, we don't. It really, it really is honestly um, an exploration and we're really it's honestly kind of the asking That's the right questions right. without already assuming we know the answers. Oh no, someone, I, I think Michael was saying that the conversation is for the health of the theater community at large, that yeah. it's not just new plays, yeah. and how are we talking about theater as a whole and sharing audiences as part of that. Right, right. And that was a clear thing that we heard from you this morning, is that here in this local conversation, that's, there's some pitfalls there. Yeah, Jill. Well, I think just to Susan's point and to your point about the, um, I think what we were really talking about this morning is who's not in the room. Because you know your audience very well. You know yeah, what they want. Question. And I think we were spraying into who's not in the room and how do we get them in the room. Mm -hmm. And so that may be part of the focus in response to what you're saying. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, any other, from, from folks who were hurt earlier, maybe to throw in if we've left that a little bit out, to sort of seed the conversation that we'll be starting in a minute or two. Okay, so what we thought we would do is literally have you guys count off one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, so that you're split up from the people that you came with and know terribly well. Um, to go meet with other people that you probably know terribly well, but it'll just be different from the way you came into the room. Um, we're going to have a group here, a group in the lobby, um, a group upstairs in the main room, and I think we can also use the conference room as a separate room. So, like, one, two, three, four. Would where they go. Where, so where where are the where, where are the here's here? one yeah. will be here. Yeah. Two will be in the lobby. Okay. Three will be in the big part of the upper room, and four will be in the conference room. Where the refrigerator is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, do, I don't do vectors. I do slash kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, four.
practicing. I'm just staying here. Right, right. Yeah. She'll be like, sit on the floor. Wow. Well, it's <laughs> cross-legged positions are replaced by a graphic, but we can hear you speaking. Okay, let's check. Keep us all on. <laughs> <laughs> and, are you here? Um, so, so how about if we phrase it as, what are our assumptions about theater? And, and why people go. What are our assumptions about theater in the context of why people go? go? And not go. Okay. Especially and the people who aren't in the room. And then, how are we using yeah, that right. to, to yeah. push them away? When we can use and do we have a scribe? I am the scribe. So, but, but does, who's, who's going to report back to the room, though? Oh, that's up to you guys. Someone should report back to the room. We can decide later. But when we come back, we're going to. I can do that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sorry if I missed. Beat you up. Just to throw out there, because I thought it was an interesting conversation to start having, more than I started talking about. Um, uh, the coolness slash sexiness factor as one element and, um, and to sort of frame it in the context of getting people to go to other people's work as well I think an element of that is that like if somebody is really um, attending your theater it seems like they've latched onto something that really resonates with them that they find cool, sexy uh, riveting something like that that um, isn't necessarily translating to uh, the theater world at large. And um, in, it, we were talking about that in order for uh, theater to really have a lot of 
relevance just culturally to sort of like be um, bubbling up and fermenting through cultural culture in general, it needs to sort of like have that <clears throat> that energy under it um, that's going to keep things bubbling. And so um, part of that, I think, for me, has to do with what our own assumptions are about what theater is and what can be, and then also really thinking hard about um, what assumptions audiences in the Bay Area are making themselves about what theater is and how we are um, how we are fulfilling both the positive and negative assumptions about that and w how we can shift our own thinking about making theater, showing theater, um, collaborating with other artists and with our audiences in a way that's really going to make that bubble up. Because our, our conversation started with this, like, if you could rebrand theater as a whole. And I think the, the probably obvious stereotypes are that it's for rich people and old people. And how can we make it something that is accessible, something you'd want to just run and do? And, and how also the assumption of we, we let reviewers use the fun words to describe our work, which is like riveting, sexy, smart, and fun. Like we need that in quotes with a Herwit behind it. Or <coughs> instead of, when we talk about our plays, we talk about plot, and we talk about who's in it. As opposed to like, well, how can we say that theater is weird and crazy, and like own that, and make it the thing that, kind of like a new bar where you want to talk about the cool, <laughs> this is San Francisco, so like talking about the cool cocktails has a different vocabulary than like, you know, the pasta selection. Like you want it to be. But theater's I'm never gonna be a bar because there's a formality built into it. When you come in and you sit down and the lights go down and you're sitting in the dark and something happens in front of you, it's not the same thing as going to a bar and possibly making eye contact with someone who's cute across the way and getting an interesting drink. It's not that. Like we have to acknowledge the fact that regardless of what kind of theater you do, because not everything has that formality built into it, but that formality is part of the preconception and so it's really hard to rectify in somebody's head formality, crazy, sexy, cool. But you can go see crazy, sexy, cool and still have the formal, I'm sitting down and watching crazy, sexy, cool, if we, if we tell them that that's what they're gonna watch. But we can because we interpret content outside of, we're used to the formality right. because we are theater goers already and I think a lot of theater goers are comfortable in the formality. But if we're talking about the people who don't go, it's intimidating to walk into ACT, it can be intimidating <coughs> because it's it's big and it's grand, regardless of what the content is on stage, the setting can be intimidating. And it's, I think, hard to sell people on that idea that it's gonna be fun and exciting and then they go into a place that is like this, formal. You sit in your seat and you sit there and you behave and you watch the show in the dark and don't say anything. So maybe that's not the place for somebody who is intimidated by that setting to start a theater go I disagree. I disagree if you're from ACT. I, I, don't, I, I think that um, it's about overcoming those perceptions. And you know, we're opening a new theater in Central Market, and part of the idea of opening that theater is how do we design it, and what does it say about who we are, and how are we still ACT, but we're ACT in mid-market. And there's been you know, a lot of the conversations are like, ACT is going to be in Central Market, and it's going to be young, it's going to be hip, it's going to be cool. Well, maybe. You know, sometimes <laughs> maybe it's going to be, and sometimes, you know, maybe it's going to be very traditional. And it doesn't mean that it can't be fun and hip and sexy and cool at the Erie. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it speaks to experience and the kind of experience you have. And so we've really looked at broadening that experience. We just had bike night last night at the Erie, where you ride your bike and ballet clips in front of the theater. So it's about breaking down that gilded palace and saying, wow, I can show up on a bike and my bike's going to be safe and I can go watch that show. So it's about how do you interpret what that experience is and, and, and get beyond the, the guilt of paint and the plush seats and talk to people about the experience. And sometimes you can just lie a little. Like, it's marketing, right? Yeah. So you can say, yes, you're going to go and you're going to sit. But you do that in a movie theater, too. And we don't think of movies as, like, for old, rich people. You know, we think of, it's well, like, how do you go and you, you make it something where you say theater is a place where, yes, you're going to sit in a seat and watch someone do something, but it can be, we can start calling it young and casual and all the opposites, just to like start calling it that and see if that changes. I mean, <laughs> one, 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 one person. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. 
My job is just to moderate and make sure. <laughs> <Okay. you know. laughs> no, I. Hmm, wow. Okay. Um, one minute. Uh, we're talking about what is theater. I, mean, I, I just feel like the elephant in the room is who's not in this room having this discussion, right? And you sort of look around, like who had a day job, who is geographically distant, uh, who is perhaps coming from a community of color or from a, another background that maybe not. So I just want to say that we're making a lot of assumptions. I mean, we as artists have adopted some, might say co-opted the dominant culture's language when it comes to theater. We, we're each our own business. We have a brand. We have to market, not advertise, because that's Mad Men, right? We're <coughs> marketing. And you we're know, calling plays work and performances of our scripts as playwrights. These are productions. Now we're being labeled as generative artists in the name of inclusion, right? So to incorporate device artists. So it's not just single vision, not that's just a playwright in the era. But the idea that um, you know we produce and the institutions control the means of production, sorry to be Marxist. I'm, I am a Marxist, but more Groucho <laughs> Marxist. <laughs> I would never be a member of but you know, happy as a member. But the idea that Ever since Citizens United said that you know, corporations are people, and this idea that you know, nonprofits, like the NFL is a nonprofit, right? The National Football League is a nonprofit. And when we talk about theater, this idea that theater is this monoculture, it's this thing. It's like, I can say I love theater, I can be passionate about theater, but it's like saying I love music. There's certain genres of music that I would die for. You know, give me tickets to a Sting concert, I'm like, I'll, I'll out myself on that. But like, country music? No, I'm glad it exists, but no. So I'm, I'm sort of read this, but there was a, this, this moment where I was just like, we're talking about this corporate culture and it, it's just, it's, it's become a, such, such a pervasive part of our discussion that the art and the artist sometimes get lost. I want to have the discussion with the audience. I would love to be in residence where literally my job was to work with an audience, have a virtual residency. You know, do the thing where you're, you're sitting at a desk and you sort of watch me work, that model. And I love the idea of like what Mike Daisy did. Now, whether you love or hate Mike Daisy, either one, I mean, the extremes, the polarization, what he did at, at Joe's Pub, mm -hmm. sitting in the one place you could podcast because of union regulations, and if we have a frank and fearless adult conversation about that, it's the 21st century, for fuck's sake. But, when he sat there, it's a little off topic. Keep going. <laughs> when he sat there, when he sat there and, and had this conversation out into the ether, and people downloaded it, and everybody has one of these, and they put it in the SoundCloud and listen to it or not, that was a discussion that was not about the public theater. It was at the public theater. It was in the bar, in Joe's bar. But that idea of having the one to one or one to many or many to many conversation that eschews the idea of what this modern culture is. The sitting in the theater, in a Lord theater, shut up, sit down in the dark, and watch. That's one kind of theater. I would and make a, an observation that maybe as you think about this concept of what is, how we talk about assumptions about theater, I'm struck by the fact that it feels like some of you were talking about the building, mm -hmm. and some of you were talking about what happens in the building. And, and, yeah, and that's where some of the monolithic of, quality yeah. comes from, is that we, are we... But are we talking about how we feel about these assumptions, or what other people's assumptions are, the people who aren't yeah. having this conversation? Yeah. Because I think we can make that distinction as practicing theater artists, but I think audience members who are not as well-versed don't necessarily know how to make that distinction. Well, if we confuse it, imagine if you don't know <laughs> yes. we know. Yeah. Maybe. Right? I, I'm struck by the fact that everybody who has spoken so far seems to be wanting to um, throw out some of what is unique about theater. Um, you know, there are companies like mine um, that do do away, actually, with the formality. You know, we don't have seats that are riveted in the floor. You can move your seat and people do. Um, people walking by on the street can look in and see what's happening. People are dressed very informally. It's very fun, accessible, visible, etc. But there's also something to be said for this experience. And if we have the kind of theater that does allow this, I mean, this is magic. I mean, just sitting here in this room, there's something magical about it. And why can't we communicate that? Um, at my theater, it's a really great place. What, what's been very popular for us is intergenerational theater going because the 
stories that we take are diverse and they're for a, young, a younger audience. We specifically use the program for younger audiences. Our, our core audience, we're working with people in their 30s and 40s, and our audience began growing because the people, the w working women, started bringing their retired mothers. Their retired mothers told their friends, and suddenly we're programming for 8 and 16 to 49, but our fastest growing demographic is older women. Um, and, you know, we have families of subscribers with three generations coming to our theater. This is still one of the few activities in America that crosses across generational boundaries. There are things that are special about theater, the way that we're doing it, and we're not talking about it. And instead, we're trying to reinvent ourselves to be something that feels like false marketing. Why do we have to lie about what's special about us? We're fucking special. I think we are too, and I think the lie is if the truth is that a lot of theater goers still are 50 and up, and we want what was successful about your company, then we have to talk about theater in a way that, I don't think it's lying about the magic, like it's, that's why we're all here, is because it's magical, and it's easy magic, it's simple magic, it's, it's imagination in front of you, but the idea that trying to, to not be afraid to continue to make the argument about why theater is magic, Say that it's not just magical for people who've been going for generations and generations, but it's magical for six-year-olds and 16-year-olds, and that if we can talk about it in a way that isn't, like, that's all we talk about. But for me, I, I look around, and I'm a young writer, and when I was 16 and starting to be a playwright, I would go and see no one my age there except for me, because I loved it, or when I was at school. But how do we get that, how do we get more of the knees to, to be, that's the thing I think about on a Friday night, is I want to go see a play at ACC or, or Marin or wherever, um, as opposed to I want to go see a movie or stay home and watch this or go out to a bar or you can actually see, but you know what I mean. Like, how can theater be the thing that isn't the theater, but is the like, oh my gosh, the theater, I love it. I mean, just try, and I feel like if we can't do that in San Francisco with the kind of community we have here and the tech and the energy and the innovation and the sense of what's next, what's new, what that's what we want, then like we're doing it bad if we can't make the thing that is so creative and so new and, and magic popular. <laughs> if we can't do that, I don't know, like we've got to figure out how to talk about it in a new way. And I think for all of, of us, that, not for one theater. Right, ex yeah, exactly. And I feel like Trevor's actually saying something really important about the perception of theater that it is a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, like what Mugwumpin does is like totally different from what ACT does, which is totally different from what Golden Thread does, you know? Um, and and all of them are like amazing and worthwhile. And um, and there's something really, um, I think, exciting for audiences about understanding that it's, there's a lot of difference there, and a lot of variety. But, you know, I, uh, I talk to my non-theater friends and there are definite ideas of what theater in the Bay Area is. And honestly, most of them don't, aren't like, and that's a good thing, you know? <laughs> no. But if we're looking at like rebranding the concept of theater, if there's so many differences, how do we rebrand theater as a whole thing when the experience at each one of our different organizations is so different? How do you unify that brand magic? Mm -hmm. It's all magic. It's all like, it's, and, and, Go ahead and then. Oh, that's right. Go ahead. That connection. I mean, this is these are the conversations that we had when we were starting um, Alter Theater. It goes back to that unique connection between live performer and live audience member. However, it's constructed. That's the single unifying thing among all our company, or a single unifying thing: live performer, live audience member. But I think people who aren't in the room don't know that experience. So how do we make it obvious that they should? And I think that's, I mean, I think we're all having a lot of different conversations. Does everyone know, do you think that people understand the differences between your theaters? No, no that's actually, I, I think they don't even understand the nonprofit versus commercial. No, but, but in terms <laughs> of the, sure. no, no, that's okay. Um, I think it's, it's our responsibility as theater artists and producers to help define those differences and, and enjoy them ourselves. So like, um, after I did Waiting for Bado, um, ACT was opening their Beckett plays, and I got a call from ACT's box office saying, hey, we really want a Beckett friendly audience in um, to see the show. We know you've done it. Can you bring some people to the show? And I was like, wow, that's incredible. Like, 
I would love nothing more to like have an opportunity to reconnect with the audience that came to see my show and take them with, you know, like Jill said, in hand mm -hmm. and go see a show there. That takes knowledge of our community. It takes wanting to integrate our audiences, which is something that is probably a good conversation to have too. And like the ability to do that, just communication wise and physically. But I think that's part of it. I don't think we have to rebrand us as an entire art form, but I think knowing what's out there for ourselves and then getting involved that way and being the audience person that says, hey, you really like the show that we're doing. Mugwump is doing something kind of like it, but way <laughs> you know, more extreme. And then go, you know? Um, that's what, and I, you know, because I was saying earlier, I worked in the music industry for a long time, and that's what they do there. And it's really mm -hmm. effective. Labels talk to each other all the time, and they present together, which you know a lot of companies are doing now. But then they also like go out and support each other's record releases. And it sounds like a really simple thing, but I think it's a really high impact way to mm -hmm. build audiences. Mm -hmm. I think that there's also, um, for similar reasons, I'm a little wary of uh, the term rebranding, but also. Um, I think it's not just rebranding, but also, um, you know, the assumptions that, um, like, it's for older, rich people. I think we actually need to look at our work and say, are we making work for older, rich people? And is that what we want to be doing if the answer is yes? And if we're not, how do we communicate about that better? Um, <coughs> so it might not actually be just rebranding, but also, um, yeah, like uh, thinking about engaging with the audience not as marketing, and maybe not even putting it into the hands of the marketing department, but rather um, that we are here because we want to communicate with people, you know, that we want to have relationships with people. So let's have relationships with people. Yes, yeah. I feel like people know when they're being marketed to. Or lied to. Yeah. I think and people are savvy. Yeah, and, and it's not necessarily about lying, because I don't think marketing departments deliberately go out to lie to audiences, but they're, they're selling something very clearly. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about when an artist reaches out yeah. is that it's not a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. It is pride about the work that they've created. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, I think there's, a, there's an interesting way to make that more part of the conversation um, because because it's then it's it's about sharing your work and it's not about selling a ticket. Right. I no. think the best marketing is truthful and it is coming from a place of honesty and openness and sharing that experience is proselytizing to not preaching the converted because it's, it's either either you're lying or I'm wrong and so many people have that like I've never been to theater I don't know what this is like it's this big gilded oh, building yeah. what do you mean I can take my bike what do you mean there's a play on stage with people who look like me, who are my age, who have you know, relevance to, to my life experience? Um, perhaps it's because I worked at the Theater of Area for eight years and went to many TCG conferences. Um, the Bay Area is unique. I'm a Bay Area boy. Uh, we do tend to share. And uh, we say San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, we're in Berkeley. I mean, there's a sense of we do go to each other's shows. We do share lists. We do talk to each other and promote each other's shows because rising water raises all ships. We've all heard that. It's such a cliche, but it's true. That doesn't happen in other areas of the country that I've seen in a very organic and northern California Bay Area type of movie, parky parky way. But there's this amazing added quality when people realize that for themselves and go to your theater and you go, did you like this? Go check them out. It's, I don't know, it's just this cachet. It's this good housekeeping stamp of approval. And I think that that was just part of the DNA of this discussion of, we believe this is true. We've probably done a very bad idea of telling people about what theater is. Or all they think it is is Broadway shows, because that's the, the, the mainstream experience. And they don't know that a nonprofit mm -hmm. community theater, a non-professional theater, can be doing amazing work in a strip mall down the street from them. I've lived in San Francisco for 20 years. I just moved to Vallejo. It was 
small theater in Lay was closing. And it's funny, I, I just saw this thing about the sixth extinction. And let's, let's talk about the, the, we seem to be going through this extinction in the ecology of theater. The big and small theaters are just going away. And OK, it was Vallejo Music Theater, so they did Oklahoma. But there were small communities of color that had their shows, that rented the space out. That's gone. The, and it, it just won't come back. So something else has to take its place. Um, so the confusion between the brick and mortar building, I sometimes think is it's endemic because people see the theater and go, oh, that's a theater. And if you talk about theater, sometimes people, oh, is it a movie theater? Oh, it's a live theater. Oh, it's, oh, it's Broadway. It's, it's that stuff I didn't like when I was in high school. Oh, wait, no. It's this amazing storytelling experience. Since we're talking to audiences, it's going to be really interesting among other things to try and just understand what those words are. Do work, Clark, because I think there's as much negative as there is positive. Well, and the building versus the experience. Yeah. And, you know, especially people who want to start at something, like you have to grow your things to do. I mean, some of what's so unique about Alter Theater came about exactly because of these conversations, just going out in the street and saying, hey, you go to theater. You want to keep it on the street.
and um, start to get a little of everybody. <laughs> right. Um, and second, you know, Warren, I think you're making a lot of great points, but I, but to me it sounds as if the world you're sort of describing is one of where everyone is a theater sports fan, and because you're a theater sports fan, you go to any game with any pairing of teams in any arena. And I think the difficulty is that the allure of sports, like what Mark was saying, you know, despite its origins, you, know, you have your hometown team, or you have the team that you support <coughs> and the colors that you wear and the game that you will watch any Sunday or any Monday, like any time of the year. Games. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, how does, how does it translate? I think my first question is, how does that affinity for, how do, how do we translate the affinity for what is typically one team or one activity to the, the broadest possible cut of that whole pie? And then I think the second question that's been percolating in my mind is we're having a lot of great ideas to get people into the theater for the first time. But there's a spectrum that exists between the people who've never been to the theater before and those of us who sit in this room and go to the theater all the time. And how do we propel someone from after the after they leave for the first time, how do we get them to come back? And is that through getting them to come back to the same organization or getting them to come back and see the work of the same company in a different place or the same artist in a different place? Or is it getting them to go across town to the other organization that's doing something completely different? But that's what I think for a lot of, like my sister is 22 or something, and she doesn't have that loyalty. She doesn't have it to a TV channel, a movie theater that she goes, a TV show that she watches. You know, she'll maybe have a movie star that, she'll, that she likes or something like that, or like a book series. But it's like, I think that young people, which who are more <laughs> on Twitter and more of more the visual that's they're, they're the ones that were, were I, I'm, I'm interested in them, and the idea of go to any play, I think is more what they would do than I'm going to every play that ACT does. They may go to the one that sounds awesome to them, and then Crowd of Fire is doing something else that sounds awesome, and then that two live folks sound awesome, and I think that thing is, I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying mm -hmm. I think people are a little bit more scattered um, in their attentions than that kind of prescription, prescription model thing is. Um, I mean, that's a question I want I'm sorry. You and then, no, no. Okay. Uh, I feel like, I think, is going to get people coming back is if they have a really good experience, which is different from seeing a really good show. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, and I'm interested in sort of like doing a little brainstorming of like mm -hmm. what that might be. Yeah. I mean, one thing, we try to think about like, think about our pieces as experiences and um, and collaborations but I also think about like um, like I went down to Austin and saw the room next mm -hmm. of their space and something that's awesome about this space which which I wish I, that we had sort of a home base to replicate is that like they um, out in front of their theater they just have you know everybody knows the picnic tables mm -hmm. and like they hang out at the picnic tables after the show and the audience goes and hangs out at the picnic mm -hmm. tables and everybody cracks a beer and it's like you just sit outside and like it, it, maybe you're not even talking to the artist, but you feel like you're part of what's going on. And I think that that's really powerful. Yeah. Breaks down the wall. And, yeah. and, and, oh, here sorry. and then there. Yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking, you, you, I, rich old people have come up several times, and I think sometimes we vilify rich old people. And I actually aspire to be a rich old person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, which is also has tank.com. And they're like, how is our, what, is our, what are our subscribers going to do? They're going to freak out and, you know, they don't know the difference between the mission in 1995 and the mission today. And, you know, and so we really got out in front of it and we sent postcards to them saying, this is how you get there. This is where you park. This is the bar you take. This is the, the cab services, you know. And you share mailing lists with tank.com? We, we, <laughs> we did a survey. Uh, we were surveying that spring, and we surveyed Arcadia at the Geary, which is a very sort of APT, beautiful show. Um, um, Stoppard is our bread and butter. And we surveyed um, Blackwatch, and what we found is that, that the um, audience age skewed older for Blackwatch. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Those people were committed, they were loyal, they were wi willing to go with us and take the risk. And so I think we should not stop looking at them as a resource when we're talking about Um, so I was just going to come at it from a different way and just sort of go back to your point about the, the idea of younger people not being loyal necessarily, but also combining that with the experience. You, know, you mentioned Tiffany. Tiffany, I'll further up myself as a marketing person and say that instead of just thinking about advertising, I think a lot about experience, both as you sit in the theater and watch a show and before you get there and after you leave. Um, I think the reason Tiffany is sort of the gold standard is because it's been delivering a quality experience, because it's not just about the piece of metal that you're wearing around your finger or your neck or whatever, but it's about the service that you get from the people who talk about the jewelry with you. In the same way that our artisanal culture in the Bay Area, you know, a lot of people, when you go to the mission, you're not gonna see the people who are under 40 carrying around cups from Pete's. You're gonna see them at Revolution or, you know, at a different, sort of artisanal coffee shop because it's as much about the experience of where you're going and paying twice as much for a cup of coffee because of it um, as it is about the beverage that you're actually choosing to drink. So when you have something that's magical and that's not a commodity and that is ephemeral and is fleeting and all of those things, you know, we spend a whole great deal of our time. We love our artists. Mm -hmm. We do. Absolutely. You're one of them. You should know. Um, but we don't, as much as we love our artists, we need our audiences to love our artists and the organization. Because I think, it, if, especially if you are attached to an organization, it is the death to your company. If your patrons walk out and say, wow, that was a great show, I'm never coming back again. I'd much rather have an audience member leave a bad show, and a show that they experienced as bad, clarify, and say that, wow, I didn't like the show, but I loved my experience, you say something? I was going to point out two things. One is that I, you know, I, I feel like this rebranding idea is, is leading up a larger conversation, which is around access, mm -hmm. which is about yeah. money and location. Yes. And um, you know, a lot of folks do not have the money to see a show. Uh, I mean, actually, I should say, you know, the ACG, you can get the ten dollar balcony seats if you're under thirty. Not anymore. You can get <laughs> half price tickets at Berkeley Rep. Um, but it's still, that's expensive for some people, and it's more expensive than a movie, it's more expensive than Netflix. Um, and I also think just how you get to, I would love to see everything that Bryn does. I don't have a car. Oh God, bridges mm -hmm. and <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know. Really, uh, bridges kill us. It's kill us. really tricky. So I feel like those, rebranding is one thing, but actually being able to get folks into the theater once they're excited about it is another. In regards to the, what you're talking about, the fact that people will pay obscene amounts of money for artisanal things, I think the thing that sells a $7 cup of coffee is the narrative of it, right? Mm -hmm. That this is the, this bean comes from wherever. 20 it's miles got, away. It's yeah. got flavors of this and this, and we do it in a certain way. It's got seven dollar cup of coffee. Right, this is a tattoo. Go to San Francisco. We don't have seven dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Let's what? not talk about what's happened to Brooklyn. Yeah. 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 Joe at the deli. Right, but luckily, theater is the art of narrative. This is where we excel. And mm -hmm. so it seems like, you know, if, if we can't figure out how to craft a narrative that yeah. is appealing to an audience around a show, which gets into this idea of how, when do you bring in the artist to engage with the audience? And if you do it from the beginning, you get the audience really excited about this artist, and the fact that you come all the way from, some, you know, some Sumatra, or wherever the, you know, right. parody equivalent of Sumatra is, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I feel like that's 
that's a thing that people mm -hmm. struggle with. I think that you know what we are we used to sell shows are you know uh, capsule reviews um, and um, yeah. you know uh, often not terribly compelling production stills, mm -hmm. but we aren't selling the show as an experience through the narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, that's, that's a really great point. I want to say, as a non-artist, that is the thing that surprises me. That surprises me the most. Is that the people who are in the business of telling stories mm -hmm. cannot tell their own stories. I know, it's crazy. Right? I understand that. Well, I also just wanted to ask, when you, the, what you were just saying about the place versus the experience of play. Mm -hmm. A, do you think you sh do the artist, can you explain that to the artist? To the artists. Right, because it's, it's very telling and honest to say, you're right, that the thing, they've got to come back to you even if they don't necessarily come back to that play. Is that a, do you think you think that way, is that a subscription? I don't, there's just. I don't know if it's, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I think it's a, uh, an attitude that pervades our single ticket marketing more than it does our subscription That's marketing. Um, Those are the people you want to have come back again. Exactly. Yeah. And, well, because, and, you know, subscribers, you have three to seven chances to get them back. If the first one doesn't go so well, yeah. there will be others. Okay, you know, um, and explaining it to an artist, you know, I, this may be a privileged position coming from uh, Berkeley Rival where I work, but it's, I think it's as much about saying, being able to say to the artist that you are serving the broad range of work that we do, and that in the interest of wanting to have them back someday, it's probably in our best interest to sell the experience right. as much as it is the point. I think we're going to lose the room. Yes, you are losing the room. Okay. <laughs> Can I say one last thing about marketing? I learned to lying, and that's sort of somehow got tied with marketing. I think marketing, my wife is in marketing. My wife is the most honest person I know. It's true. So the idea, and that the artist can work with the marketing department to tell the story. I think they're that the best ally you so have. Down yeah. yeah. No, I didn't. I had all this rundown. I think they all had a very different dynamic, too. Yeah.
was focusing on first time theater doors a lot and we should also be thinking about return, uh, getting people to return after that first experience, talking about the good experience versus the good show and valuing the good experience over the good show, uh, talking about not vilifying retold people because 
as, <laughs> as somebody very astutely Some of us stated, are getting old. Right. Some of, somebody astutely stated that we aspire to become rich old people. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the comparison to a comparison to Tiffany's, and um, at first it started as a conversation of how um, we offer something uh, maybe more emotionally uh, an experience, whereas Tiffany's you get a ring. But on the same token, Tiffany's has its value because it offers an artisanal experience. And then we start talking about coffee and how there's this artisanal experience about coffee as well. And this is, I think that's another conversation as far as there are some people who don't want artisanal things and actually back away from the artisanal things. So that's a whole other conversation. And we talked about access and how money and location, we didn't really delve into this, but money and location are also factors. Wow, okay. <laughs> Um, let's keep moving through so we get to all four groups. So two, <laughs> what's the best way to summarize our, our second group? Like, do you want to just do it if you were Yeah, I got some, I it wasn't, um, we didn't make it too much past uh, really talking about, you know, immersing new audiences and how to do it and how to uh, cross-pollinate. So a lot of it was focused around that. Um, there is talk on um, the idea of, uh, Fool's Fury does this kind of ensemble-based consortium where they... And um, others, and many other <laughs> consortiums. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that, um, so you, you were speaking about that and how that's a way to kind of bring people <coughs> at the very beginning as artists, and that brings your audiences closer together because you're sharing people who are making and bringing, uh, drawing a lot of connections there. Um, we talked a little bit about what happened to the big list and how that's, you know, something that's going to be used again. Um, the idea that Gold Star is bringing in people in a very specific way. We talked about um, how that tool is used and the people it's bringing in and um, that there's other ways to reach them. Uh, and a lot of it just generally talking about the kind of culture of theater, how to make theater cool, how to make it trendy, how to make it like food in which it has its own um, kind of connotations that people you know, do when they come to the Bay Area. They want to experience the Bay Area theater just like you have in Chicago and New York scenes like that. And then um, we got into a bit of the differences between the scenes being that, you know, because we have all of these, um, a lot of smaller theaters doing a lot of stuff and the diversity of the work is so great. How do we capitalize on that diversity rather than let that work against it? How does somebody, a first time theater going to Bay Area, see a show at a radically different theater and not take that to be the one thing that theater means as an art? Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of a, a main point of ours that was interesting. Um, not to be, not to have people who don't know the depth of the art be stuck in one idea of what it can be um, when you're bringing in new audiences. Um, uh, how do we create community uh, where we are and let that expand the art? Um, yeah, we talked about branding and how do we, you know, work on the branding of the San Francisco theater. Um, and uh, there's a good point made about the economic reality of all of us taking so much time in order to produce the work that how do we balance actually being able to, um, you know, balance that challenge with actually being able to work on the side of it that is expanding, you know, the definitions of expanding the audience in the theater. Um, things like that, I, those are vague and not necessarily well clarified. Did anybody in my group want to expand on those? Although you were taking notes. I didn't sign. Know? I just said, uh, I said notes maybe on some people's individual comments, but. Well, when do I, why don't you let him do well, it? Well, I would first. say dive in. <laughs> okay, on the spot here. Um, we all reintroduced ourselves. <laughs> that was important. Um, we focused on two things. I think the sports analogy came up again. Um, we. The sports analogy came up, the what makes a bear area unique came up. We centered around the notion of trying to capture the, uh, being a part of the economic engine that's driving this area and the privilege, but theater feeling sort of like the right-headed stepchild, still outside, outside that. People did ask the question, you know, what is theater now? Why is part of theater sort of the general brand of theater? Why is that a little more old-fashioned, a little more traditional feeling? 
what are people doing in their individual institutions, large or small, to push away from that old feeling. Um, we talked about this pressure to make theater either more bite-sized and accessible in observance of what you know what digital media is is capable of now. And we also talked about growth in the other end, um, time-sensitive performance, the five-hour play, the ten-hour play, the twenty-four-hour festival. Um, we had a lot of really passionate statements on engagement. Uh, we had a few good ones about words that people don't want to hear anymore or words that they hate. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 you want to share a little bit. Generative, Generative. was a word that was, <laughs> like, was called out with some fury. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think other, other things that people, uh, I, I, I think that th there was a lot of frustration around the idea of the audience's like sense of obligation or like your we're good for you or your commitment to us and like that sense of what are we telling the audience that they are supposed to do when we get here and and another thing that caused a lot of, I'm sorry. No no keep going. I, I, I tend to get really worried and excited. Um, another thing that caused a lot of passion at the very end was the idea of Someone made the point that we we do so much as artists to create the thing, but we only let the audience see this part of the art. And what if we, uh, I wrote down, uh, what are we already doing that's extraordinary that we can invite people to along the art that gets us to the production itself? Mm -hmm. Anything else from you, sir? Yeah, uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether you can truly have the broad appeal that you wish for, or whether you just gotta pick your niche and stick with it. Will you really get, you know, 15 year olds next to 25 year olds next to 75 year olds? Or are you just gonna have to go for 35 to 45s in a very specific thing? What what keeps your institution alive? What, what can you really do? Um, does anyone else in the group three have, have feel like they're being passed over, like the thing that they're really regretting their acts about? Well, I'll say this, at the end of the group, I had like five minutes of you just saying, ah, we didn't get to talk about engaging non-white audiences. Um, and whether, and uh, the notion of ambassadorship that occurs when a non-white theater artist is in a cast or uh, is a playwright or a director or an artistic director and the pressure that those artists feel to either successfully or unsuccessfully serve as ambassadors for their theater to the group that they are believed to represent. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, in group four, who wants to report? Lily? I will report as I took notes. Um, one of the first questions was, um, why would an audience go to the theater is a very different question from why do we want them to want to go? And um, they're very different answers. A lot of audiences want to go just because the storytelling is great. Um, but we want them to want to get lessons on empathy and all of these <laughs> things. And there was a comparison um, to movies about how theater is different because um, in movies, you, you can want to have the experience to all to yourself, but in theater, nobody wants to have uh, theater to themselves, that, that what theater is cannot be replicated outside the auditorium. Um, and there, there's, let's see. Um, are, are we responsible as artists to create both the entertainment and, and the profound experience, the, the, the bigger idea. Um, it, is there something wrong with going to the theater just to appreciate its beauty, the, the set design, a good performance? Um, what one of our presenters, or, or one of our participants presents only to children, and anything that that artist presents is new, because they're children. Um, <laughs> empathy isn't why they're they're coming in in the door. Um, another person said, "Well, we have to define what we mean by enjoyment. Sometimes, for 
some people it's knowing all that dramaturgical material is what their enjoyment is, but for others, just getting the entertainment is what their enjoyment is. So then, then we went to how big and wide is our range of responsibilities, and are we, is it wrong to ask all of the, all theaters to do every single responsibility, to preserve the canon, to expand the canon, to expand audiences, uh, our obligations to artists, and that we often all feel all those obligations, but they're driven by multiple agendas, and um, do, do we have, it, it's making a difference between our obligation as a field and our obligations as individuals. Um, and maybe in everybody feeling all those obligations, that moves us toward homogeneity. of what theater is is different from what practitioners is, but that's great because then it's exciting to engage them and we can have a discussion about that instead of it being flat and not talked about. Um, and this was a great question. Um, at what point did we decide that the audience should enjoy and have to be the guinea pig before the work even gets good? <laughs> and what, why, why should they enjoy that? Um, a question about newness. We are aware of when work is new, but does the audience know that work is, you know, this is a world premiere that it's been done three times? Do they care and should they care? Um, we talked about kind of how this con whole conversation dates back to outrageous fortune, and maybe what we're doing now is trying to address um, both the issues artists have with theaters and the issues audiences have, and maybe trying to answer them at the same time. We're combining those questions. Um, and, and so regarding the, one of the last questions about artists being involved in the process, um, some artists are great communicators and others are terrible. Um, artists in a survey may all say they could help, um, and really want to, but would they actually be good at it? One <laughs> excellent line was, here's your Twitter account, artist, go for it. Um, is that a good way to do it? Um, so it, in this increasingly transparent world, however, it's incumbent upon us to be more open um, as <laughs> theater companies. And so we'd be foolish at least not to ask the artist. And so, um, one person shared this line as, what a theater does is bring, is bring the audience. That's what they do, they bring the audience, which sounds both banal and quite profound. Um, and there's a tension between theaters who feel that artists have this strong opinion about how their shows might be, could be marketed, but it's not always wise, but the artists feel like they're, those theaters are saying they can't do my work because they feel like they know their audiences, but it's my work and I, I know it will succeed. And um, there, those conversations, someone felt it would be better we, we all need to start from the place of bringing our best selves to the table, meaning we need to assume that we're all here to serve the work and the organization and that a lot of the time those conversations feel like they're starting from a, a hostile place. Um, so a uh, controversial statistic um, from Berkeley Rep.
So for for them, that was a, a huge, a hu like a, a paradigm shift in the way they shared or did not share their lists of ticket buyers. And so when, when there are these numbers, when someone is only seeing four to six shows per year, do you have an obligation to send audiences to other theaters? And why would you send them if, if you know it isn't going to be good? Um, and so um, a, a great response was about her at the Magic and um, New Conservatory, and, and how maybe one, one reason that you would send them is that you can, in exposing your audiences to more um, adventurous programming elsewhere, you can prepare them to experience that more adventurous programming at your theater as well. Um, another issue, though, is uh, people who only go to mostly or solely to one theater in an entire year are more likely to give more to that theater than people who go to many different theaters and might uh, spread their philanthropy accordingly. So that is yet another in incentive to perhaps not send audiences elsewhere. But then there was the great point that it, can't it be a growing pool of the number of shows you see per year? Is it stuck in uh, four to six shows? If an audience member sees enough shows that are really good in those four to six shows, won't that be adding? And it, it's not mercantilistic, in other words. Um, and especially with shows like Wicked and Mormon, for the Book of Mormon, in that case, it's not, oh, I'm going to see this show instead of that show. It's that will add to the total number. Um, and then the question was posed, is there a way to, for theaters to raise money like Obama instead of like Romney? And the universal response was, none of us have enough people to raise money like Obama. <laughs> um, well, you're gonna have to wrap it up a little bit. Oh, four minutes <laughs> <on the line. laughs> uh, oh okay. Um, Communities of taste. There's this idea that um, every person has um, multiple kind of taste circles, taste communities. Like, I like uh, bicycling, but also theater, but also cooking gumbo. So <laughs> is there a correlation between, if there's that correlation, how do we find the gumbo cooking people and make them also become theater uh, people? Um, so, That's good. Okay. <laughs> 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 right. so, we hit it literally four to four. So here's the next steps. <clears throat> Bear in mind that one of the things that we really want to do is figure out what we want to be asking audiences more. And we heard some stuff just now about, it's really interesting that last one to me about if I go to more stuff, what is that, how does that really, does that really impact on how I feel about the home base place and right? Can I have a first and foremost here, but you know. Um, when we get around to asking these questions and we're gonna work some with Alan to figure out what form that takes, um, we're gonna need your help. Right. Somebody said in Washington, well, what you really need to do is come back and ask our audiences this. And we're like, yeah, right. There's not you know, that kind of money we don't have. Um, so we're going to need, we're going to be reaching back out to you when the time comes about continuing a conversation, if you're willing, with some of your audiences in some way that's really easy. This is not about asking everybody in the room to do more work. This is just about, because, you know, Washington was Karen and said, it's all more work. Um, you know, it's not about more work, but it's just about trying to get to those folks and trying to have conversations in, a, in five or six different places. So part of what we're gonna do now is tease out what <coughs> we're hearing about what people want, what we need to know more about. But as you think about what you, I mean, the idea is that this, you go away, just like we hope they leave the theater, that we go away and keep messing around a little bit with this issue. There's a lot 
that ha has come up about, I think we want to have more conversations with marketing directors. We had a marketing director in our group who was wonderful and outed him or herself as a marketing director, which felt brave, um, and led to some interesting conversations about you know, led to some, I'm, I'm joking a little bit, but led to some interesting conversations about is it about the play, is it about the place, who's the person, like, you know, how do I want them? So we need to get some of them in the room because think about Zani's research where, you know, the theaters felt pretty good about the way their marketing directors were doing their work with respect to the work that they're doing and the playwrights didn't feel so good about that. And so I think, is that a conversational problem? Is that a, or is that a, so those are things we're gonna come back about. Um, we have set up, or we will be setting up, or we, are, we, we have set up a place on our website at TDF. We will be emailing you the link. That's the right term, right? Mm -hmm. We will be emailing you the link um, to really continue the conversation. Um, so we'll begin, so if you have thoughts, or we're inviting people to just keep having the conversation about, you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't about, it, it isn't a conversation just about, the point of what do we think about when we think about theater is, really about what do we need to be communicating when we think about theater in order to ensure that there are audiences for all of the different kinds of work that we do going forward. Um, is that a fair? Right, and I just wanna, uh, it came up several times this afternoon and I just, I think it, it bears repeating that there isn't a right answer, right? It's, not, and it's much less, do we already know it? Um, there's not, there's not going to be one thing that we derive from this is a Eureka, this is the, the way that we will now announce to everyone in December when we get to Boston. But, but how can we suss out and understand more deeply um, multiple different ways of, of bringing in audiences, of attaching, uh, of connecting audiences and, and artists and, and that <coughs> relationship that they have with each other and with their theater company. And I think it is more about these multiple sort of ways and, and bright spots and and understanding those better, and then each of you being able to understand in your own work, in your own theater company, in your own writing and theater making, and maybe we all come out of this with an enriched understanding of a universe of ways of doing this, n not being able to boil this down to, this is the thing, now we discovered it. Yeah. This is really helpful. I mean, this is a Petri dish, as it were, so mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you, Tori. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Peter Barry. Um, and did I, it's w, you want to, they'll go, it's www. We should send them the link. We'll send you the link. <laughs> so, okay. thank you. Thank you.